Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and testify of what we have seen, and you do not accept our testimony. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up so that whoever believes will in him have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. Okay, number, I got to look some up real quick. What am I doing? start talking about it, let's talk about the Sanhedrin. Because we know, you know, those are a ruling, like a ruling council of the Jews, but we really don't know necessarily much about them. Okay, so the term Sanhedrin comes from a Greek word that means council or assembly. And it goes, dates all the way back to the time of Moses. Uh, In the Torah, God commands Moses to gather for me 70 men of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people and officers over them, and bring them to the tent of meeting and let them take their stand there with you. That's in Numbers eleven sixteen. 16. Uh, also in the 16th chapter of Deuteronomy, in verse 18, it says, you shall appoint judges and officers in all, town, in all ta- our towns that the Lord your God is giving you according to your tribes, and they shall judge the people with righteous judgment. So the land was divided up among the tribes, right? And they shall uh, judge the people of righteous judgment. So they divided the, the, the land up among the tribes. And then in those areas where the tribes were, uh, there were towns and villages, right? And in every town and every village, there would be a court, right? So if there were at least, you had to have at least 120 men as heads of family, and if they had 120 men or more, they were big enough to have uh, a court and also a synagogue, actually. Uh, If the town was really small, uh, they would have... uh, Yeah, if, if a town was really small, they would have three judges, and then if larger towns, they would have seven judges that sat as as a court, uh, both as judge and jury, all right? And that was in all legal matters. Of course, all legal matters in Israel, for the children of Israel, were religious matters because it was a theocracy, right? So it was a true theocracy. God is their head of state also, so secular matters and 
spiritual matters are the same thing. Everything falls under the same category. So then you have the great Sanhedrin, with capital letters and scare quotes, uh, which was the Supreme Court of Ancient Israel. And that was 70 men, uh, primarily Sadducees and Pharisees, because it's politics, and they were the biggest parties. All right, so Pharisees and Sadducees, and the high priest always had a seat on it. Uh, in the second temple period, so that's the period you know, where Jesus is, that's the second temple, um, the great Sanhedrin met in the temple in Jerusalem, and the court convened every day except festivals and on the Sabbath. And when we get to the crucifixion account many chapters from now, we will talk about Jesus' trial and how many Jewish laws they broke doing the trial the way they did. Like, it was a completely illegal trial. Uh, but that's for many chapters from now. Okay, so it convened on every day except on uh, feast days and on the Sabbath day. And the Sanhedrin as a body claimed powers that those smaller Jewish courts didn't have. So they were the only ones who could try the king, for example, like Herod, if they wanted to put him on trial. Uh, they could extend the boundaries of the temple. They could extend the boundaries of Jerusalem. So they were on the zoning committee, right? <laughs> right? And you know how much people like those guys. Uh, and they were the ones who, to, to whom all the questions of the law were put. It's like, oh, I want to understand the law. I'll go talk to these guys. Um, the last binding decision of the Sanhedrin was in the year 358 A.D., uh, which was when the Hebrew calendar was adopted and the Sanhedrin was dissolved uh, under continued persecution by the Roman Empire, which is, is 358 AD. We're starting toward the, the empire has been collapsing for 200 years. Uh, it's really getting close to being completely collapsed at that point. Uh, when they dealt with an individual uh, who was accused of wrongdoing, the Sanhedrin would meet in a semicircle with the accused in front of them. Uh, and there had to be at least two witnesses Right, under their law, who would speak or bring the charges against the individual, and then the accused would be given the opportunity to challenge or cross-examine the witnesses, kind of like in our court, except you're your own defense attorney. Uh, at the time of Jesus, the Sanhedrin had primarily become a court for discussing interpretation of the law, interpretation of scripture. So their ability to pronounce sentence on an individual was greatly reduced from the way it had been in its glory days of old. So by the time Jesus comes around, the great Sanhedrin is a bunch of rabbis sitting around uh, with their heads in the clouds arguing about God's law, basically. Okay, so that's what the Sanhedrin is all about. And then we need to talk about the Pharisees and the Sadducees. First, I have some tea. First, I have to have some ice. and the Sadducees were religious and political parties because again it's a theocracy so religion and uh, secular matters are intertwined so the Pharisees were a religious and political party that had its origin in the second century before Christ so like the 100s BC uh, during a time when it seemed as if the whole world was embracing Greek culture the Jewish group known as the Hasidim, Has, Has, Hasidim, Hasidim arose to combat that influence and to preserve Jewish ways. And that word is familiar to you because when you think of the Hasidic Jews, like in New York with the black suits and the, the, the phylacteries, 
Uh, your curls. Yep. The black tree. The curl. Black tree. Black tree. It's an unusual name for a curl. What's it mean? What's the root? Quick. Same root, but prophylactic comes from. You asked. What? It's prophylactic got to do with the head curl. Phylactery, it's the same root. I think it has a root in uh, the sense of covering. So. It's one curl. It's not covering much. You asked. You asked. <laughs> so anyway, the Hasid, that when you think of Hasidic Jews, that's where it got its start. Back then, so the the late or I guess early hundreds, think you get think backwards. So it's the upper hundreds, one hundreds BC. Okay, so uh, they broke off and they formed their own community, kind of like they do today. The ultra orthodox Jews do today. Uh, that's how they started. Uh, but there were others who remained part of regular Jewish life and formed the group that later became known as the Pharisees, which means separate ones. And they so esteemed the letter of the law of Moses more so than the spirit of the law, but the, the letter that they uh, so esteemed the oral traditions that were said to have sprung from the laws, so all those laws that they made up as they went along, right? The oral tradition. that they develop strip, strict applications of the law for everyday life. In other words, rules, right? They love rules. And um, a Pharisee was an esteemed and respected student and defender of the law, and they were considered to be careful seekers of righteousness. That they like, look how pious these guys are, because they're really, mm -hmm, they're on top of all these rules. Uh, as a result, they were considered to be the ones who would be able to identify the Messiah. <laughs> Fail, right? No. Then the Sadducees, like the Pharisees, were a political and religious party in Jewish culture. Uh, some scholars believe that they had their roots in a high priest named Zadok, Zadok who lived in the days of David and Solomon. So if you look at uh, 2 Samuel 15 and 1, King, 1 Kings 1, you can read about Zadok, but it's not certain how they began. By Jesus' day, they were the ruling party in Jewish cultural life. Uh, they were generally very wealthy, and they were generally trying to get along with the Roman government. So you have your ultra kind of conservative rules, legalist-oriented Pharisees, and then you have the Sadducees, who were the rich progressives, go along to get along with the occupying government. Uh, so the Sadducees were distinct from Pharisees in several ways. The Sadducees rejected the oral traditions that the Pharisees held on to. The Sadducees believed that only the five books of Moses, right, the, the Pentateuch, were scripture, were authoritative. So Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Uh, the Pharisees believed in the resurrection of the dead, and they also believed in angels and spirits, while the Sadducees rejected all of that stuff. They didn't believe in angels. They don't believe in the resurrection of the dead. Yeah, basically, when you're dead, you're dead. This life is all there is. So the simplistic way to remember it is the Pharisees believed they were righteous because they're, they're good works, right? And thus they were fair, you see? Okay. Pharisee. Um, and then the Sadducees didn't believe in angels, spirits, or the resurrection. So when you're, once you're dead, you're dead. So they were sad, you see, right? <laughs> that's, a, that's how you do it in Sunday school to remember what they are. Good demonic advice. Yep. Plus it's a dad joke, so win. Poor Eddie. All right, so Nicodemus was a Pharisee and a ruler of the Jews. So Nicodemus also happened to be wealthy. So even though the Sadducees are usually wealthy, Nicodemus was wealthy. So Nicodemus was a Pharisee, which means he was a legalist. He liked the letter of the law. Uh, and it's also a member, a ruler of the Jews. He's a member of the Sanhedrin. Okay, so he was, uh, in other places in the Gospels, you will hear about the scribes. And the scribes were the doctors of the law. So they are the ones that know the scripture backward and forward. They know the oral tradition backward and forward. And they sit around and argue about this stuff. The scribes. Yeah. Yeah, so Nicodemus, you can also say he's a scribe. 
you know, he's, because yeah, basically Jesus calls him that later. You know, he says, uh, are you the teacher of Israel and don't understand these things? So that phrase, teacher of Israel, that means doctor of the law. So he's a scribe. He's, he's a, a teacher of Israel. They're the keepers of the, the law. They're the ones that interpret everything. They're your law professors, right? Except in this case, the law is God's law. So John gives us a little insight into Nicodemus' beliefs when he includes the fact that Nicodemus came to Jesus at night. Why did Nicodemus go to Jesus at night? He didn't want the other people seeing him talking to him. Right. So it's like, I want to talk to Jesus, but I don't want anybody to see me talking to Jesus, so I'm going to sneak around. Who else snuck around at night? Jesus. Oh, Judas. Right. And then, fun fact, right there, this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher. Every time someone calls Jesus teacher or rabbi, they're about to get school. That's just the way this works. Every time someone calls Jesus teacher, that person is getting ready to have a lesson taught to them uh, that they were not expecting. It's every single time it happens. Right, so Nicodemus goes at night because he doesn't want the other Pharisees to see what he's up to because it's all about appearances, right? Outward piety, outward uh, righteousness. So Nicodemus addresses Jesus as teacher. Why did Nicodemus address Jesus as teacher or rabbi, which just means teacher? Why would he do that? Did he do that to indicate that he wanted to learn from him? Possibly. Or was he being sarcastic? He was being sarcastic. Right, because you think he was being snotty? <laughs> but look what yeah. he says afterwards. He goes, for no one can perform the miraculous signs you're doing if God were not with him. He says that right after that. So is he being sarcastic? I don't know. I don't know. In the part of my te teaching thing here, it says, uh, afraid of being discovered, Nicodemus made an appointment to see Jesus at night. They like conversations between Pharisees, and Jesus tended to be antagonistic. Yeah. But Nicodemus really wanted to learn. He probably got a lot more than he expected, a challenge to a new life. We know very little about Nicodemus, but we know that he left that evening's encounter a changed man. He came away with a whole new understanding about God and himself. That's a generous description of Nicodemus. I wouldn't go quite that far. But here's what I see happening in the, in the language of their conversation. Nicodemus is genuinely curious about this guy, and he does want to find out what's what. But he's also a rabbi. He's a teacher. He's a doctor of the law. And he kind of understands, well, Jesus is doing signs and wonders. So he's, he's, he's not a shlemiel, right? He's, he's an actual legitimate teacher of some sort. He wants to find out more about him. So maybe he's not being sarcastic, he's but, but he's going to maybe. That would be very in keeping with the culture because now they're going to start verbally sparring in a good-natured way. So there's, when we come to, you know, Nicodemus go, well, how can a man climb up in his mother's womb again, right? Like, he's, he's being playful. He knows, like, okay, that can't be what you mean, Jesus, because that's ridiculous. Uh, there, there's a lot of humor in this exchange, to a point. Uh, humor, maybe not, maybe not sarcasm, but kind of a dry wit, like very, have you ever seen Jewish scholars debate the Bible, like Scripture? It's 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 hilarious because <laughs> they're very polite to each other, and it's like, okay, I have my opinion, and your opinion is wrong. It's like, no, I have my opinion, your opinion is wrong, and they do it, go about it very politely. It's just like, burr, 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 burr. Uh, actually, come to think of it, seminary professors do that too, and <laughs> seminarians sitting around smoking cigars also do that. So yeah, it's hilarious. Everybody's very polite, very nice. Nobody can really say anybody's sinning against somebody. But you're really trying to tear somebody a new one and prove you're right at the same time. And it's hilarious. It used to be that way in politics. It used to be. Yeah, yeah. No more. Yeah. Okay, so 
Nicodemus mentions those signs that he's doing, and signs in the, again, in the Gospel of John, the word Simeon, that's important. John makes a point of, of calling all of Jesus, and he goes and calls miracles, he calls them signs. Uh, and Nicodemus mentions these signs that Jesus is doing. Why is that important, coming from a Pharisee? Given what we just talked about with Pharisees' belief. So why is it important coming from a Pharisee? Well, if they supposedly don't believe, but yet he's acknowledging it. Well, what did they believe because the Pharisees were so steeped in the law? It was assumed that they would be the people that would recognize yes, what? The right, so the Pharisees were always assumed to be the ones who would recognize the Messiah. And how do you recognize the Messiah? Because of those prophecies say that he will do these signs, right? So Nicodemus goes, well, clearly, you know, we acknowledge they never denied his miracles, right? They, they might have yelled at him, well, it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, you healed that guy, but you did on the Sabbath, come on, can't do that, it's against the law, right? They never denied that he actually did the miracle. They didn't deny that he raised Lazarus from the dead. In fact, that was so scary for them, they tried to get Lazarus back in the grave. You know, they Wait. started, they started, yeah, it's, it's in scripture that they schemed to put him back in the grave. They wanted to kill him. know that? Yeah, they tried to put a price on his head. Oh, wow. And, and they put a price on Jesus' head right after. They don't talk about that in Sunday school. <laughs> mm -hmm. But it, yeah, it's right there, plain as day. Um, so, so Nicodemus, being a member of the Pharisee party, who are supposed to recognize the Messiah, it's like, ah, there's some crack in the thick skull. He's seeing, he's seeing what he's supposed to see. He's checking it out. Maybe, maybe this one's going to believe. And he probably ultimately did. Do you remember on Good Friday, the reading? Who brings the spices? It's Nicodemus. It's Nicodemus. So is he honoring Jesus? Did he actually believe at this point? Did he have saving faith? It doesn't say. It doesn't say. You have to speculate. But it's like, why would he do that? Or, or was it, well, in a works righteous uh, religion, maybe he was atoning for his treatment of him. It, we, we don't know. We're reading into the scripture at that point. But it's like you have to wonder, why did he bring all those spices? Did he, did he, maybe, what? Just in case? Just, maybe. I don't know. It could be any of those things. We just don't know. So keep that in mind as we see Nicodemus again later. But I never really thought about that before. It's like, did, did he or didn't he? We still don't know. We still don't know. I don't think he knew at that point. Hmm? I think he was on the fence at that point. That's what was so great on that show, The Chosen, when they showed Nicodemus coming to Jesus by night and they had their conversation. And then when they're getting ready to go on the next part of their journey, Nicodemus is like behind the corner going, because he's wrestling with it. It's like, I, I want to follow him, but I can't. I want to follow him. But yeah, yeah, I have power, I have prestige, but I want to follow. So he just leaves a bag of money and walks away. <laughs> like your guys, you know, doesn't let him see him and he walks away. And that's all, you know, made up, dramatized. But it's like, yeah, that's maybe the kind of conflict he's going through at this point. That seems reasonable, given what we're reading, that, okay, he's, he's acknowledging the signs as a Pharisee. That is important. All right, what are... The three statements that Jesus introduces with the phrase, truly, truly. So, New King James, most assuredly. Uh, NIV, I'm telling you the truth. And ESV and NASB, truly, truly. And then King James is verily, verily, I say unto thee. Right? So what are the three statements he introduces that way? No one can see the kingdom of God unless he's born again. Right? And? No one can... Uh... Verse 5. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but spirit gives birth to spirit. Uh, verse 5, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, oh, he can't enter the kingdom of God. So he says it basically again, okay. but a little bit different. And then the last one is truly, truly, where? We speak of what we know and we testify to what we've seen. Yep. Isn't that weird that that fits with what our theme was today, too? I like the older version where it says, you know, truly, truly, whatever, because this was the this NIV. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it just it says, I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the spirit. 
Yeah, if you look uh, for the Two Preachers channel on YouTube, they're just called the Two Preachers, and they've put these Bible movies together. Uh, they didn't make the movies, but I think they obtained the rights to the movies. Uh, and they're fully dramatized gospel movies. So he's got the Gospel John, Gospel Luke. Gospel John's really good. Uh, and so you have the actors acting out the text from the Bible. They're using the text from the Bible. There's no scripts made up. They're actually using what Jesus is saying. And in the background, these people are speaking Greek, they're speaking Aramaic. Or, you know, it's all authentic. It looks like it's shot on its location in the Holy Land. Uh, but then you see Jesus, every time he's running around, and he is literally running around going, you know, I'm telling you the truth. He's like, I'm telling you, he's got the walking stick. He's like, I'm telling you the truth. He looks like he's nuts. He's like really excited. He's like, I'm telling you the truth. Unless you are born of water and spirit. And you're like, oh, whoa. The, the guy that did the act in Jesus in that movie is amazing. It's like, I imagine you can tell when he's getting frustrated with people, he's getting a little angry. Like the guy that did the act, he's like, yeah, that's what I imagine. It's like what I, when I read it. Like that was a very good portrayal. So the two preachers channel on YouTube, you watch them, read the, the John one. In fact, I was thinking of watching the John one with you guys with this, but I keep forgetting to set the computer up and do it. Uh, but it's, it's pretty good. It also makes this class twice as long because you have to watch the video and then you talk about that chapter. So. But yeah, watch it. I think it's, uh, it's well worth watching, and I really do enjoy the John one. Uh, the Luke one's pretty good, too. Okay, so the those three those three state are the three statements he opens with truly, truly, most assuredly. What is meant by born again? Look at Titus three five before you answer. Titus Titus is first Timothy, second Timothy, Titus. Philemon Hebrews. Ish, I think. Titus is Titus what? Yeah, it's weird how that works, too, isn't it? Yeah, Titus, yeah, Titus 3, 5. He saved us not on the basis of deeds, which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit. So what is meant by born again? Through the Holy Spirit. Yeah, but Paul just said <laughs> What Paul just said to Titus, that's exactly what born again means. Justified by his grace. Yes. So again, justified means declared not guilty, declared righteous. Um, sanctified is to be made holy. Justified is to be made, to be uh, acquitted, to be judged not guilty. Yep. Okay, so born again. Now, how does Nicodemus interpret Christ's words born again. And again, I don't think he's doing it literally. I think he's playing with Jesus. It's like, okay, I don't understand what you're saying. And in that very Hebraic way of thinking, it's like, how can, can you just hear the accents, right? How can, how can a man be born again, right? You can just hear it. It's like, how can a man be, can I climb back up in my mother's room? Of course, that's ridiculous. So talk to me. What does that mean? You know, so he doesn't, Everybody wants to make it like, well, Nicodemus took Jesus literally, and isn't that silly? Ha ha. It's like, no, he's not. He, he's, this, this guy is a rabbi of rabbis. He's a Pharisee of Pharisees. He's a teacher of the Jews. Okay, this guy's a scholar. He, the two of them, the rabbis, are having a friendly debate, a friendly chat, and they're having a little fun with it, too. And it almost seems like, it's not like Jesus comes right out and says, this is what, it's almost like he's playing back with him. He's oh, not yeah. being clear. Jesus does that all the time. Yeah. And he uses hyperbole and sarcasm. Verbal sparring. Yeah, that's what Jesus does. Like, he kind re of... Remember the woman, the, <laughs> is it the Syrophoenician woman, right? Yeah. No, it's the Samaritan woman. And it's like, you know, he's looking for her blessing and goes, hey, you know, a uh, woman, you know, it is not right for... You know, to right. the dogs to eat the food that's meant for the children. It's like, oh, and she's right back at him. Right. Well, it's like, oh, well, yes, master, but even the dog eats the scraps that fall from the table. Right. He's like, yeah, that's <laughs> what I'm talking about. I mean, that's, oh, everybody gets so serious when they preach it. And it's like, that's one of the funniest passages in the Bible. It's like, they, everybody else is probably all like, what's going on? And like, the two of them get each other. They are having they're having a little play on words because he knows she believes, 
and she knows he knows she believes. And that little story is for everybody else's benefit. It's not for their interaction. They're already, he, she knows who he is, she believes. So that whole story is for our benefit, not theirs. So it's not serious. It's, like I said, it's one of the funniest stories in the Bible. This is right up there. This is a humorous exchange. A lot of people want to interpret that. They're like, oh, Nicodemus is being dunce. No, he's not. He's a scholar. All right, he's a religious scholar and a leader of the Jewish people. He's not dumb. He knows what he said. And that's just how, that's how you have these little debates, these little chats. And he almost turns on it because he kind of gives an answer where he doesn't really answer. So Nicodemus pushes him and says, well, I, wait, explain that. How can this yeah. be? Explain it. And then Jesus goes right back at him and kind of spars him and goes, what, you're a teacher and you don't understand? He's like, like poke him. Yeah. And there's a, well, why does Jesus say that? Well, what? So you didn't understand the words that just came out of my mouth, which when you first look at it, should Nicodemus get that? Why would he get that? Why would he get that? Well, let's look at why he should get that. Well, look, at Isaiah, look at Isaiah 32, 15. And he's spoken back at him to, to try and get him. It's like, here, here, doctor of the law. Let's let's go back and read some scripture. So Isaiah, what was it? Isaiah 32, 15? That's what you said. Yeah. Yeah, but as soon as I said it, I had to look at my paper again because I forgot. I see it. Which says, until the Spirit is poured out upon us from on high and the wilderness becomes a fertile field, and the fertile field is considered as a forest, then justice will dwell in the wilderness and righteousness will abide in the fertile field, and the work of righteousness will be peace. Right, so, you know, this whole chapter is about the future. This whole, whole chapter is messianic prophecy, among other things. That's one of the things with the prophets is this stuff means like three things at once. You know, it's like a prophecy of what will happen to the children of Israel if they either do or don't do something God told them to do. Then it's also usually a messianic prophecy of the Christ when he comes. And it usually also means something else. <laughs> That's just the way, you know, the way that stuff works. Uh, look at Isaiah 44 3 while you're in Isaiah. Right, and you have this pouring language. For I will pour out water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants, and they will spring up among the grass like poplars by streams of waters. This one will say, I am the Lord's. And that one will call on the name of Jacob. And another will write on his hand, belonging to the Lord. Which, that gets written on you when you get baptized, by the way. All right, so you've got that, that water washing baptism language. And then finally, let's look at Ezekiel 36. You said poplar. Mine says willow. Yeah. I like willow trees. It's too bad people cut them down. Would you stop already? You need to make peace with it. Okay, so Ezekiel, and these are all, all prophecies of future blessing to Israel. And you're like, but these are prophecies of future blessing to Israel. Yeah, because when their Messiah comes, right, this is the promise that if you die in belief of that promise, you get to go to heaven because people in the Old Covenant go to heaven too. So here's another, this whole chapter of Ezekiel. Ezekiel is a fascinating book. Ezekiel 36, 25, Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. Does that sound like Psalm 51, perhaps? Also, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Okay, so Jesus right back said, how can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he can't enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it. You don't know where it comes from, where it's going. So everyone who 
So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. And Nicodemus says, how can these things be? Jesus answered, said, are you the teacher of Israel and don't understand these things? So teacher of Israel should know those prophecies. Like cold, they have that stuff memorized. So yeah. Jesus is genuine. I think Jesus is genuinely spread. Like, oh, you don't see that that's what those prophecies mean. Which you should now because Jesus just told you that. It's like, yeah, what Jesus just said should make sense. Those words should be familiar to his ears. And that should be really, it's like, okay, you're seeing a guy that's doing the signs that they prophesied that the Messiah would do. And now Jesus is saying this stuff that makes a lot of sense compared to Isaiah and Ezekiel and those guys. And it's like, you should be getting a little closer to going, you are the Messiah. But he doesn't. So what is verse 6? What is the message of verse 6? That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. What does that mean? What? You guys are Lutheran and you don't know what that says? <laughs> <laughs> Little joke, right? Like, what? You, 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 you guys are followers of Martin Luther, and you don't know what that means? That's, that's the simul. That's the simultaneous saint and sinner, right? So your old sinful nature, which is born of the flesh, right? You know, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. Flesh can't save itself. But that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So that is the saint. That is the regenerated individual who has been baptized. And you're both. We're both. So that's the message of that. It's like the things of the flesh remain things of the flesh, but things of the spirit will always be things of the spirit. In particular, the Holy Spirit. Right? And then the work of the spirit the way we understand the work of the Spirit also comes from these verses. You know, you, the, the wind blows where it wishes, you hear the sound of it, but you don't know where it comes from or where it's going. That's what the Holy Spirit does. That's why we're not supposed to be concerned about how many people we have in church on Sunday or how many new members we're getting or what the numbers are or any of that. Or, well, we, we did this program for outreach, but we're not sure, you know, how many people actually came to faith by it. So we should question whether we do them, spend the money to do that or not. We're not supposed to be concerned with that. We're the we're just supposed to scatter the seed and not actually care where it lands. The Holy Spirit, as the confessions say, Holy Spirit works when and where He wills. Period. Not up to us. It's up to Him. He is the one that grants growth. He is the one that creates faith. So we're just supposed to take the word and go. And God says His word does not return empty. So it'll do something for the purpose for which it was sent. And we also get some of that from these verses. Oh. Okay, in verse 11, which is a fun verse. Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and testify of what we have seen, and you do not accept our testimony. Jesus said, I say to you, and you do not receive. The first you is singular, and the second you is plural, which you're not going to get from most of our English translations, mm -hmm. uh, unless it was written in uh, you know Southern American vernacular, and then it would have been it would have been y'all and all y'all, <laughs> uh, but it does not say that. Uh, does anybody have a King actual King James? That's the beauty, that's the one beautiful thing about the King James is it actually makes, you know, a second person, first and second person pronouns like that. It makes the distinction. So you, that tells you if it is a you or use guys, all use. Right. Do you have your old one on your desk? Yeah, I don't think I can read something that small today. My eyes are shut. Let's see, King James. 
let's look that up. King James. John 3. What is it? 311. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that we do know and testify that we have seen and ye receive not our witness. So verily, verily, I say unto thee, that would be you, and then we speak that we do know and we testify that we have seen and ye, you guys, all y'all, receive not our witness. How does that help us understand what Jesus said? Knowing that. Because that's that's one of the shortcomings of modern English translations, is you don't get that. So I say unto you. Well, he's saying it's prophesied. Or it and you don't receive our yeah. witness. But no one's accepting it. This Well, the Sanhedrin are not accepting it. The Pharisees. He's done how many how many signs, how many wonders. He's given it to right. different people throughout. And people are talking. Yeah. But they're like, mm, no. Right. Yeah. I like how Jesus is, is using the royal we also. You notice that? Like Jesus is, is saying, you know, I say unto thee, we speak, you know, and we do. And you do not receive our testimony. Where else do we see that plural? Church. Actually, I'm thinking further back in the Bible. Okay. Somewhere around Genesis 2, I think, the second creation account. And let us make, no, it's the first creation account, it's Genesis 1. Uh, and let us make man in our image. Yeah. Right? And the fun thing about Hebrew is you have. We know that's people say, hey, did not, you know, they didn't know, Jesus didn't have the Trinity. Yeah, they did. Because our, let us make man in our image, there is singular, dual, and more than two. Mm -hmm. So they have, they have two kinds of plurals. One that just literally means two, and one that means three or more. And that our, let us make man in our image, that's the three or more. That's kind of cool. So you don't have Trinity. Didn't, who are the three or more people speaking? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Anyway. What earthly things did the Pharisees not believe? So Jesus talks to them. So yeah, so we go, you were where you already covered that. All right. So they didn't believe the earthly signs he did, the physical signs. Turn the water into wine. He did all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, so... If they're not accepting the signs he's doing, well, like Nicodemus, I mean, he's curious. His curiosity's peaked, but he's not there yet. It's like, if you guys don't receive the signs I'm doing, how am I going to talk to you about the kingdom of heaven? There's no one else doing those kinds of signs at this point in time, is there? I mean, I know there are people out there claiming to be... Yeah, there's, there's false messiahs running around, but there, nobody's doing anything like that. Okay. Yeah, so... And then what did Jesus say? Like, you know, Jesus told them they have Moses and they finally says to the Pharisees, you know, they have Moses and the prophets. Like, if they won't listen to Moses and the prophets, then they're not even going to believe even a man rises from the dead. <laughs> right? Which they didn't. Was he talking about himself or was he talking about Lazarus? That's why I was just wondering. Too. I think Lazarus. We'll talk about that one again. I just thought of that. It's like, is he talking about himself or is he talking about Lazarus? Neat. Maybe both. <laughs> Maybe. Because otherwise, why did he raise Lazarus from the dead? Other than he had a lesson to teach. But there's, I think there's more to that story than I've ever really considered. I should read what other people have written about it. Because I don't know. Well, they better get me done. Yeah. Okay, how is the Son of Man like the serpent lifted up in the wilderness? Remember, remember the bronze serpent 
the look and they would be healed. snake on a pole. Yep. Right. So, so that bronze serpent on the pole is a, a typology, is a type of Christ. So, God said, "Okay, make this serpent out of bronze, and every time you raise it, anybody looks at it, they're not going to die." So just as that serpent was raised up in the wilderness so that all you had to do was look at it, that's all you have to do. Whoever believes in Jesus will have eternal life. And I think people forget John 3.16 was spoken by Christ. That that's Jesus talking this whole time. You know, people want to say that that's John narrating. It's like, that Jesus is still stalking. That's got quotations around it. Yeah. Okay, so part of this that we never hear, because we hear the progressive of the world, and you know. Mm-hmm. And we like I never read John three sixteen without seventeen. But we also hear, for God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. But you never hear the next part. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe in Him stands condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. You never hear that part. Right. Right. Kind of sobering. Yeah, it sure is. Well, maybe they don't say that all the time because people don't believe it. It would just drive people away. Yeah, I mean, I think. You know, again, that, that it's too good to be true. Look, all I have to do is just believe that Jesus died for me. For some people, if you said yeah. that, they'd be like, "What? What? What? What's the catch? What, what, do, I, what do I? What do I? What do I have to do? What do I have to do?" Right. Well, that's human nature. Yeah. Nobody does anything for free. Yeah, what's in it for me? Okay, so that's, what, that's what's what's, what's the angle? What's the angle? What's your cut? Right. Give me the pitch. Good. Uh, Yeah, this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and the men love the darkness rather than the light. I mean, that's where John got what he wrote in the prologue, right? It's like, how did John come up with that? Because Jesus just said it. You know, in him was light, and the light was the life of men. And the light shined in the darkness, and the darkness not overcome it. Where did John get that? Well, other than the Holy Spirit, inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But it's like, just right there. That's what Jesus is talking about. The light has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed, but he who practices the truth comes to the light, so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. Because Jesus, the good Lutheran pastor that he is, just disproves works righteousness. Right there, right? He who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. In other words, your good works are the product of God, not you. You do the good works because you're God's instrument, but through you, the Holy Spirit actually does good works. You don't do the good works. You know, all our good works are tainted. All our good works are not good. And unbelievers' good works, even though they're good works by our standards, they do, they take care of their kids, right? They're nice to their wife, right? They help old ladies cross the street. But those aren't good works if you're an unbeliever, in the sense, the biblical sense of good works, which is God-pleasing. Because nothing you do is God-pleasing if you don't believe in Him, right? Right, so the, all your deeds may be manifested, meaning revealed, meaning as having been wrought in God. So your good works are an extension of your faith. They're a result of your faith. That's probably a good place to stop.